Wisdom and love within my heart. Wisdom and love within my thoughts. Wisdom and love within my words. Welcome. I'm Sister Who. Today I just wanted to offer some thoughts on the question word, if you, of, if you will, of perspective. Uh, which I don't know that we often think of it as a, per, as a question word, but perspective determines so much. And when we ask about perspective, when we consider the questions associated with perspective, it gives us an entirely different, well, many different, entirely different ways of looking at things. Um, I considered once, when I first went hiking in the mountains of Colorado, I went with a friend who knew something about the flowers and plants that grew there. And he pointed to one along the way as we got near a summit and s said that it was a particular flower that only blooms once every seven years. And I considered for a moment what it would be like to live out of doors uh, on the side of a mountain uh, buried with 10, 12, 20 feet of snow part of the year um, on the side of this mountain waiting for seven years just to get to the point of blooming and the notion of having houses or living in them would be totally foreign concepts that the flower couldn't possibly understand even if it had a mind adequate to do so and somehow that after seven years of waiting and striving and saving every little shred of energy it would have just enough to bloom for one summer and then die back to a few leaves for another seven years before it could bloom again and I mean, that's a perspective on life that is so different from uh, what we expect as people. You know, in having dogs as pets and companions, I mean, they're really my family. And yet, every time I've gotten a new puppy, I immediately have to acknowledge the expectation that I will outlive the puppy, because dogs don't live as long as people do. And so I get to be there when to watch the child, exp to watch the puppy experience its youthfulness, its childhood, its beginnings, and I get to be there to to witness and to support this dog as it um, ends its life, in as it grows old, and perhaps different organs begin to fail, or all sorts of uh, age-related conditions happen, and to surround it with as much love as I can every moment from the beginning all the way to the end and yet knowing that because of differences in life forms I'm going to outlive this per this this four-footed furry person who has become uh, or, or quickly would become a, a member of my family and um, it it's a different perspective on life and one that reminds me to take the time to give my dogs love when they come and interrupt something I'm doing, to give them a pat on the head, to to remind them that I love them, to be with them, and to take time out to play with them, because I know there will be times uh, when I wish for the opportunity and don't have it anymore because they'll be gone, and uh, and when they go, I will re most of all I will regret every time I didn't take the time play with them and to be with them and to love them and to pat their head and they're so forgiving and so unconditionally loving and so excited about the simplest things. I have a sheepdog who thinks the greatest thrill every morning is getting out of bed. Um, if I could have an ounce of that exuberance about waking up in the morning, it would just be amazing. Uh, it, it's a remarkable example that he sets for me to, to be excited and happy and and whenever somebody comes to visit the house, he is so thrilled. He just jumps all over, not all over them, but jumps up and down, running around the room, wagging his whole body. It's just total uh, joy at somebody new coming to visit the house. And uh, I've mostly trained him not to jump up on people, um, but to ask him to stand still in one spot is, is just unrealistic because he has too much enthusiasm and too much excitement. And, He's just so happy just to see somebody. I wonder what humanity would be like if we had that much enthusiasm and excitement for greeting each other every time we met. You know, that uh, every time I meet somebody, 
I, I smile and my eyes get bright and and I respond with enthusiasm. How wonderful that you're here and I mean it. And, you know, not just to say it, uh, not to go through the formalities, not trying to imitate what I wish things would be, but which they may or may not be. Um, in the same respect, I guess, to be as honest as a dog, because I don't know that my dogs ever lie to me. Sometimes they try to hide things when they know they're guilty, but they never try to lie to me. Um, the very concept is probably something they don't understand. And so, in a sense, with each of them, I'm given a, a remarkable angel to set a better example for me of dealing with my own emotions and expressing what I feel and being there in the most complete sense for those I love each day of the each day of life that we have to share because we never know when it's going to be all over people are killed in car accidents or come down with diseases every day and as one person said sometimes uh, each of us is somebody else's somebody else that when we say it always happens to somebody else well sometimes we're the somebody else for somebody else and um, and so it's important to take each moment to love and to have the perspective of, of things being big or small, of seasons passing, of the perspective, the perspective that uh, honesty is the best policy and there is an advantage to be gained by being dishonest. It may not really be the advantage you want in the bigger picture. I have seen so many shows and heard so many scenarios in which honesty, uh, dishonesty is presented as being the kinder um, thing to do. But I really don't think it is because what you begin to do when you're, when you're trying to take the pain out of a moment by being dishonest, what you're creating is an artificial world so that you really, all you've done is transfer the pain from that moment to another moment where the person has to deal with the fact that what they're living with is an illusion and not a reality. If we can train ourselves, equip ourselves, educate ourselves to deal with honest truth, then it is always better to know what am I really dealing with here and to recognize that it has pros and cons. Every situation has pros and cons. Whether a situation is good or bad comes back to this question of what's the perspective. For the one who wins the game, the perspective is that we had a great game. To the one who loses the game, the perspective is that it was terrible. Everything went wrong. Uh, I was really off today. My muscles were sore. I got a cramp in my arm. Any number of things. The challenge of our multidimensional reality is that both are equally true. Because truth is very contextual. And that's part of perspective too. You can't really talk about perspective without identifying the context. It's because it's the context that gives a perspective. And most of us go through life each day looking at, uh, dealing with things, doing things, and not really paying a lot of attention to the pieces and parts and, and constitutive elements of what it is we're dealing with. I drive a car every day, but I couldn't tell you the first thing about how to fix the engine. I you know, pick up the telephone, but I have no idea where that wire really goes. Uh, I imagine it goes underneath the ground and downtown someplace to some big office building where there's complicated computers and equipment and, and then somehow it goes from there through, a thou through thousands of miles of phone line and, and communicates with something on the other side of the planet in seconds. Um, it's, it's, al it's almost too much to comprehend. But I use it every day without necessarily understanding it. There's a perspective that understands all the wires, and there's a perspective that doesn't. And in this specific case, I more often have this perspective that doesn't understand, but still utilizes that thing. Part of living life and becoming all of who and what I can be, and, and the same as each for each of us, is becoming more aware of how multidimensional our lives are, and how many other perspectives overlap and intersect with ours so that when I'm winning, does somebody else have to lose? Or is there a perspective from which we could do an activity in which 
everybody was a winner and nobody was a loser. And uh, I've, I've often said to some of my friends, it's not over until everybody wins. Uh, because I, you know, growing up uh, in a Roman Catholic environment and going to Catholic school for six years, one of the first things I learned from the nuns was this uh, basic understanding of interconnection, this perspective that everything is interconnected and we're not all separate beings that have no bearing on each other, but that everything I do has an effect on those around me and everything they do uh, potentially has an effect on me. I have to decide I have to decide how to respond to that effect, to respond to what they contribute to my life. But I can't decide what they will contribute to my life, only how I respond to it. And so but but there are people who have the perspective that whatever somebody does to you is actually done to you. And well I did this of course because. Well, you did it because but the of course is really kind of conditional because there is a typical way that people respond to a certain um, action. If somebody uh, slaps you on the face, uh, the typical response might be to get angry. There may be somebody who chooses a different response because there are other responses that are possible but they're probably not going to happen by accident, only by intention. When you train yourself to respond to any great or, or small action of violence in a peaceful way, you can steer the situation in a very different direction. When somebody slaps you, instead of slapping the back to calmly and directly, or as calmly as you can, to say, and what did you mean by that? Is there, if there's something you want me to understand, let's talk about it. That, of course, is my approach, but there are some people who don't do as well with talking or with communicating. They want to, their language, if you will, uh, their perspective is that interactions are community, that interactions, communications happen more by gestures than by words. That you can say any words and they may or may not mean anything. And that's true to some extent. Uh, but I think there's enough to be gained by choosing the nonviolent responses because from a nonviolent response you can move to positive places much more easily than from a violent response. If violence happens and you answer it with violence, we have a cycle of violence going on and it becomes very difficult to step out of that and say, what are we fighting about anyway? Why can't we be friends? Uh, because ultimately we probably both want similar things. We just haven't figured out how to come up with a solution where everybody gets uh, what they need or, or what they want. Um, or or to, take, to take that perspective of stepping back for a moment and saying, is what I want really good for me? That's another perspective. One of the perspectives I had in Catholic grade school was that if someone brought a candy bar to class, for example, and one of the nuns noticed that this person had a candy bar, they would basically instruct them, did you bring enough for everybody? If you didn't, then put it away. It has no place here. They were always emphasizing how we needed to be inclusive and that if one person was going to enjoy something sweet, then everybody should have the same chance. It's not about one person being better than another or worse or one person deserving it or another person not. Occasionally I run into people who in, when we talk about economic differences and lifestyle differences, they say, well, I work very hard for what I have. And I say, no doubt. And I know a whole lot of people who have worked every bit as hard or harder and have not been rewarded. What's with that? What's the story? How come they didn't get rewarded when they worked every bit as hard as you did? And if we say, well, it's not my problem, that's disconnecting and it fractures the relationship and ultimately it's a lie because what happens to somebody else, what happens to anybody else is our problem because it's part of what adds up to the collective world that we share. The world is a shared space. A lot of perspectives don't take that into consideration but it really is because every bit of air pollution that somebody sends up 
to the atmosphere in Los Angeles is going into the same atmosphere that at some point will float over uh, London or Moscow or New Delhi or Beijing or anywhere else on the planet. It's all one atmosphere. Everything that goes up into it, regardless of where it comes from, creates a global environment that we've all contributed to. And if we've all contributed to the problem, it's imperative that we all contribute to the solution. And so when there is somebody who is having a life experience that is not positive and they don't have the resources they need to get their needs met. It creates one individual and perhaps if that pattern is repeated enough time it creates a whole collection of individuals who don't have their needs met and are not going to be happy with uh, the society and the situations and the programs that have been set up and at some point they're going to get tired of putting up with it and that's where we start getting into criminal activity and such you know is it is it a crime if a starving person steals a piece of bread uh, or steals a loaf of bread in order to feed him or herself um, we would say yes because everything's governed by an economic system somehow then we need to make sure that every hungry person gets the food they need so that they don't need to steal it we need to be sure that everyone has legitimate ways to get their need met because if we ignore that problem it creates other problems for us only by creating win-win situations by having this perspective that we're all in this together and the world is a shared space we begin to understand that when somebody else wins it creates a better world for us if we live in a world where nobody goes hungry and everyone has everything they need we may not need a police force anymore because nobody would have any reason to break the law obviously it's a bit more complicated now that's a very simplistic way of describing it but the point being if we do a better job of taking care of each other we have less to worry about in terms of all sorts of criminal activity when we don't take care of each other when we neglect loving each other when we take the perspective that I'm the only one that matters or the company is what matters, not the individuals. It, it's not an either-or situation. They both matter. The, the manager matters and the worker matters and everyone matters and everything matters and somebody else needs to have legitimate ways of meeting their, prob meeting their needs, solving their problems, uh, getting things resolved. If they don't have a legitimate way of accomplishing that sort of resolution, we can hardly blame them when they do something wrong because they're no longer willing to tolerate being the one in need. It's, it's never, there is no one for whom it's okay to leave them in need. Most of human history has been this demonstration, a perspective of the predominant group, which is different in every case. Uh, all different races, all different nationalities, all different countries. Uh, I mean, in, in some sense, humanity, the history of humanity is a history of one people group displacing another at regular intervals. And uh, just for the record, they weren't all white. Um, there were people of every race and every religion and every, every description. Um, when I was in graduate school, there seemed to be this, pre this uh, ridiculous notion, ridiculous in my opinion, that racism was primarily a categorical societal conflict between white people and black people. The problem with that in that context was that the people with whom I spoke became totally blind to the occurrence of racism between any other race. That when someone black did something racist towards someone who was white, or Korean to Japanese, or Chinese to Thai or um, Estonian to Russian or Inuit to Eskimo or Crow to Sioux Indian Native American um, there have been conflicts within and between every people group in human history it's it's not if 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 only it were a problem of specific categories because then we could eliminate that category and the problem wouldn't exist anymore but there's no category you can eliminate and eliminate racism because it and and this it's this thing of perspective 
who was the oppressor and who was the victim, but in every situation throughout human history, regardless of who the participants are, anyone could be a perpetrator or a victim, depending on the circumstances. There is no one who has never been a perpetrator, and there's no one who has never been a victim. We've just done it in different ways, and we may, be, we may not be very conscious of it, but it's still there. The point of, uh, or, or the goal, of creating a peaceful global community in which everyone is loved, we are pursuing wisdom, we are pursuing peaceful, harmonious ways of sharing this planet and of nurturing the planet so that it is sustainable, so that we can be here as, as long as the Earth shall last. And perhaps by that time we will have uh, developed um, some sort of spaceship so that uh, when our own sun uh, eventually goes through its life cycle and, and turns into, uh, what did the scientists say? They, they, it has a life cycle and then it goes into a red giant and then basically burns out. But it, it takes millions of years, but at some point it does happen. And if, if, um, if we haven't prepared for that by the time that comes, and if we haven't gone to the stars and traveled to another galaxy, everything that's been accomplished will be burned away and, and uh, remembered only by spirits, not by physical forms. Um, as they said in the, uh, in one excerpt from the star, from the uh, television series uh, Babylon Five, that that when that goes out, if we haven't traveled to the stars, uh, the the death of our own son will result in the death of of every philosophical and literary and and musical and and scientific mind in human history. It will be the end of Lao Tzu and Einstein and Beethoven and Edison and uh, countless, countless uh, other humanitarians and, and inventors and scientists and theologians and philosophers. It will be the end of, of everything that we possess if we haven't found a way to take all of all that we've accomplished, all the wisdom we've collected, and to take it with us and expand out into the universe. But that's a whole other discussion, and one that uh, for the present time is, is mostly in our imaginations, but it's a foundation for the future we can lay if we have the perspective to see that time may just go on and on and on and on and on. Certain theological perspectives believe that at some point the earth will end and it will not be with the death of the sun. It will be because humans blew it up or something. I suppose that's all possible. Uh, until it happens, though, that's not what I'm going to plan for. I'm encouraging uh, a world in which there is love and in which there is wisdom because I know that we can do better than that. Uh, but if we don't see it, if we don't have the perspective to see it, um, I suppose one could ask, you know, in, in the question of perspective, what perspective do I need to understand this person in front of me? What perspective do I need to begin to learn their language and to understand that their language is not just the words they use and the sentence structure, but that their language is the way they see the world, the way they understand things, the way uh, ideas are hooked together uh, and relate to each other. The uh, unstated assumption, every language has unstated assumptions. You know, and there's a perspective within that language that because it looks at life and looks at the world around in a certain way, begins to select words and order sentences to reflect that understanding. And this all comes into the question of perspective. You know, in the introduction to the show, the perspective uh, question word comes with uh, me reaching my hand towards some honeybees on, uh, I believe it was some Russian sage bushes, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, they were busy doing their work, totally oblivious to my existence at all. And here I am, this big creature who has the ability to terminate their, terminate their life in a second by clapping my hands together over them. Or if I threaten them in some way and they get to me first, they could sting me and I would be in pain for a certain amount of time. And my perspective in being there was to enjoy the beauty of the appearance and the smell of, the, of these flowers that they were working on. For them, it's simply a food source. 
uh, it's a different perspective and the plant was simultaneously satisfying both perspectives providing a food source for them and a beautiful appearance for me and they're both equally true so truth is multi-dimensional perspective is multi-dimensional each of us is multi-dimensional and life is multi-dimensional and but it we don't need that doesn't need to be an exhausting kind of too much awareness too much awareness I can't comprehend it all rather it's an abundance of opportunities that there is something wonderful to discover within each moment and it can be a different thing every time you don't have to encompass it all in one viewing in the same way when you meet a new person you don't have to encompass everything within the first conversation but you do need to end every conversation with some kind of openness to the conversation continuing that and part of that to me is allowing their perspective to be every bit as true as mine allowing the perspective of the honeybee that this plant is a food source to be every bit as true and not to attempt to prove them wrong because I'm right I'm right yeah right I have a perspective and my perspective is true they have a perspective and their perspective is true and ours aren't the same and that doesn't make either one of ours less true in order to be friends in order to continue the conversation in order to continue positive relationship I have to allow their perspective to be their perspective and to be true from their viewing and experience of life and they have to do the same for me I'm not trying to convince them that I'm right and they're not trying to convince me that they're right we're each experiencing and embracing life in our own unique perspective in our own unique way taking the opportunities we find you know that they found a new food source and they were very happy to find a new food source and I was very happy to find something beautiful to look at and to consider for a moment the difference in scale and how small they are and how large I am and how in comparison to other animals and forces in the universe I am as small as the bee in comparison to those larger forces and my footprint on the planet is so tiny as to be invisible to someone viewing the planet from outer space perspective there's a lot more than just meets the eye I hope this has been a helpful half hour for you thank you for sharing this time with me